Hi, everybody. Welcome to this edition, the spring edition of the Marianne Key Book Club. Uh, my name is PJ Maracle. I am an associate librarian at Minneapolis Central Library, um, and I'm also uh, an enrolled member of Mohawks of the Bay of Quinney at Tyndanaga Mohawk Territory. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Um, for housekeeping, uh, tonight's program will be a conversation between Debbie Reese and moderator Myron Medcalf during the first hour. There will be time for an audience Q&A, and we ask that you submit your questions to our chat moderators in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Closed captions are also available. Click on the arrow next to the CC icon and select Show Subtitles. At the end of the program, we will share a brief survey and ask that you take a few minutes to complete it. Your responses will help us improve future programs and tell the story of how our programs build community with partners and the public. I'd like to do a short land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that in Hennepin County, we live and work on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. This land and the Dakota people belong together. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Dakota sovereignty and aspire to hold ourselves accountable to the work of reconciliation. And I would also like to thank friends of the Hennepin County Library for their support. Um, so the Marianne Key Book Club, including tonight's program, is made possible with funding support from friends of the Hennepin County Library. I'd like to invent Christy Pearson, president of the Friends of the Hennepin County Library, to share a few words. Christy? Thank you, PJ. Good evening and welcome to this special event with the brilliant Debbie Rees, co-author of the Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People. Now, it has been over a year since Marianne Key Book Club launched with Isabel Wickerson's cast, and we're thrilled to celebrate our next season of programming with this latest compelling read. Now, we at Friends are proud to support this initiative, but the true heroes are our library staff and Myron Medcalf, whose close collaboration brings a rigorous slate of programs and resources throughout the season. So please be sure to check out the library's Marianne Key Book Club page for reading guides, group discussions, and more. A special thanks to our library, Myron, and the Star Tribune, Star Tribune for bringing meaningful discussions on race, anti-racism, and change to our community. And now we invite you to lean in, listen, and learn as Debbie Reese discusses her incredible book with Myron Medcalf. Back to you, PJ, and I hope all of you enjoy the program. Thanks, Christy. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Debbie Reese, co-author of an Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People. Debbie Reese is in, tribally enrolled at Nambe Owinge, a sovereign native nation in the Southwest. Her research and writing on depictions of native peoples in children's literature are taught in education, library science, and English courses in the US and Canada. Her blog, American Indians in Children's Literature, is widely used as a resource by those who write, edit, and review children's books. Joining Debbie in conversation is Myron Medcalf. Myron is a senior college basketball reporter, nationally syndicated uh, radio host with ESPN, columnist for the Star Tribune, and valued partner in the planning and delivery of the Marianne Key Book Club. Welcome, Debbie, and welcome, Myron. Thank you so much, PJ, for, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, Christy. Thank you to Hennepin County Library, friends of the Hennepin County Library, Star Tribune, and all the other partners in this venture. Uh, and certainly thank you to uh, Debbie Reese. Uh, Debbie, this um, book club was named after my great, great, great grandmother, Mary Ann Key, who was enslaved in Georgia and Alabama in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, as a child, I, I visited the gravesite on the plantation where she was enslaved. Um, the gravesite is still there. And I, I, I put my hand in the soil uh, where Mary Ann Key uh, is buried. And at a young age, I could conceive 400 years uh, of enslaved people to today. But when I read your book and I talk to other members, of indigenous communities, it's harder for me to comprehend 4,000, 10,000, 14,000 years uh, of a people who were here first. I guess my first question for you, Debbie, 
is why is it so important? Why was it so important for you to write this book and to talk about a history that is to me too often ignored? Okay, well, I'll start by saying kunta, which is um, thank you in our language, tewa, um, to everybody who's here tonight and for all the people that helped make tonight happen. That's all the people behind the scenes who do so much work. So the book, um, I guess what you said, Myron, as you were talking about the about Marianne Key, was is, there's a similarity, there's a parallel there because it is that ground, that earth. In your case, that that you're in your case um, with Marianne Key, it's her grave site that you you were putting your hands on the ground, and that's the land where she is. And across the country, across the continent, are Native people who have that same um affinity for the land because of what it signifies to them in the present and what it signifies in the past um, it's it's a good it's a good way to start because we're talking about those who came before and those who came before worked very hard so that we could be here today and so i think that having this book club and the conversations that you're inviting through the book club are doing right by those who came before well, I definitely appreciate that. And I appreciate, you know, this book has been such an incredible read. It's been so insightful. So I keep coming back to the same theme as, as I read through the book, um, as I think about how I was taught uh, about Native American history and the things that we weren't told, uh, the things we were led to believe. And I feel like one of the most important themes of your book is what you repeat in this idea of we're still here. You talk about terminal narratives. And there, there is this idea, and I think a lot of people believe that uh, the indigenous communities were eliminated to, to some degree and that, you know, there isn't this current presence. But I keep coming back to this reality of the resilience of, of a community that remains. How important is that for people to embrace and understand and acknowledge as they begin to, you know, try to understand that history? I guess there's so many ways to answer that. But one thing that comes to mind is that people don't know that we're still here, that that erasure is pretty substantial and pretty successful if you happen to be on that other side of that of that narrative. Um, people are native people will tell stories about getting into a taxi cab and having a conversation with a cab driver and tell and you know, who are you, where are you from, where are you going, that sort of thing. And when you say that you're a native, they like do a double take like they, they they're like, they want, you know, they look to the back seat to see who am I talking to? Um, wow. It's, it's, it's a, it's unsettling every time it happens. And it's an opportunity also when it happens. And it speaks to just how powerful that erasure has been. Um, so that's an experience of an adult getting into a taxi cab. Think about all the native kids entering classrooms across the country, receiving textbooks and children's books that erase them or misrepresent them. There's a lot of research that talks about um, Native kids dropping out of school at higher rates than other populations, Native people having um, suicide at higher rates than other people. And I think if we look at the cumulative effect of misrepresentation and erasure, it's, uh, it's not a surprise. And uh, we can do something about that. And it's long past time that we do something about that. So we're hopeful that, that, that this book can um, help teachers address that that erasure you're, you're talking about so i just went to dc uh, washington dc not that long ago um and i'm aware of that was a city built by slaves uh, um, you know that that was a city where um enslaved labor was, was how washington dc was erected so i'm very conscious of these places throughout the country uh where i know slaves either built them or, or tended to the land as I read your book, I just think so much about the land. I believe there's a stat in your book where you say in 1881, uh, indigenous populations owned 156 million acres of land. And by 1931, that number was down to 50 million acres. And I believe the federal government took 500,000 more acres uh, as part of World War II. The conversation about the land is not one I feel like people wanna have, but your book makes it very clear that we're all living on stolen land. But I think it's not enough to talk about it. What does that mean? And, and how has that affected the history 
of your people? Well, you know, what it means is that this nation, this is like, what, the wealthiest nation on the planet? How did it get that way? It got that way by wiping us off our homelands and by exploiting those lands and creating opportunities for people to um, attain that, quote unquote, the American dream, which is really about acquiring money, acquiring goods. And there's very little thought for the repercussions of what is being done to the land. That includes the, the um, mines that are everywhere and the um, waters that are being polluted, all of the extractions and uh, pollution that, that is happening. Um, I think that part, part of what we see happening is that there's no thought for what this land and the taking of this land has done to us. But we have those, we, ha we also have high, high rates of um, unemployment and low income and, and uh, seeing all this wealth that came from our lands is, is it's hard. And we try, and you know, I think some of us fall into that victimhood space and some of us say more of a, what can I do to try and address that? And so as, a, as an educator and someone who studies children's books, I try very hard to help people see that omission um, and how, how we celebrate the gold rush and one thing after another that really was a destructive thing for native people and for our lands and for the land period that was destructive. Your book in terms of you know how, how the land um, was taken in American classrooms, how I was taught, how so many others were taught, um, there's a lot of conversation about that, th this idea that these were stolen lands. You know, you hear about treaties, you, you hear about uh, the federal government creating these agreements uh, with various tribes, but you don't hear about the reality of a land that was colonized by Europeans and, and, and that narrative, that being the truth. How do we change that? And how important is it to change this idea that, you know, Christopher Columbus didn't just show up and, you know, negotiate or, or, or you know, things like that, that this was taken and the land we're sitting on is not ours? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. I think, I think because it's such a big question. There are the treaties, and we do have slogans. People say, you know, all the treaties were broken, and and there there's a general lack of understanding about those treaties that the United States made with Native nations. Um, so people don't understand that at all. You know, that's the same thing as the treaties that we make with France or or with um, other countries in the world. They're the same thing. They're, those treaties have that same status. And I, I think people don't understand, they don't, they, somehow they're not, they don't understand that fact. And, and so when you see something like um, the Twilight book that, um, is that Twilight, the vampire books that came yeah. out a few years ago? And there's a treaty between the vampires and these native people in, in Washington. And I'm like, that's not how that works. Mm -hmm. And that didn't get flagged, that got published, that was cool to the, to the editors and the people who read that book don't have clue that what, what's going on there. So it's a fundamental misunderstanding of, of a treaty as a document and what it means. And thinking about treaties, there's, there's a, a, page, a passage in the book where we quote Vine Deloria and the things that Vine Deloria said about, um, we, what we essentially have was peoples from, that were invading our lands and then there was conflict and then we have treaties and native conceptions of what a treaty was, was not just the end of the conflict. It was a, an agreement or an understanding that we are going to go forward together. We're going to be here together and we're gonna be good to each other and take care of this land together. There was a different way of thinking about what a treaty signified. With uh, Europeans, a treaty and with the Americans later, a treaty was, okay, I get this, I get this, I get this, and you get this over here. A way different, you know, this idea of winners and losers, very fundamentally different way of thinking about conflict. Um, I'd love to see more of a understanding today about what Vine Deloria wrote about what that meant to native people when they entered into those agreements, because 
we see conflict around the world now, today. And if we had a different way of thinking about how conflict ends, so it's not a winner and loser um, game, then I, I guess I'm hopeful that there could be a different outcome to, to these kinds of moments. Yeah. Your book talks about the Louisiana Purchase. Um, I thought a lot about that. And that's obviously the significant event in American history, it almost doubles the size of the United States. Um, but there were no conversations with the, the tribes that own this land. Um, you talk about this divine idea where European settlers come over to America and believe it's their divine will to take the land. How, how did that affect um, just what happened? And how important is it to understand that sense of entitlement that Europeans had when they came to a country that had already been occupied and discovered? Yeah, that whole sense of divine, that whole sense of invoking Christianity, um, a Christian God, uh, the, the will of a Christian God who sent smallpox to uh, wipe out the tribes on the East Coast. There's, there's one example after another and the, the chapters that are about these covenants and these documents that were created to justify what was going on, um, they all really rely heavily on this idea of Christianity and the Christian God. Um, and I, I, I don't know how, how to think about that. It's something I struggle with a lot because it, it sort of like alleviates people of their own personal responsibility yeah. if they can if they can say well you know god sent the smallpox jesus it, it it ducks the responsibility for the actions of today and of in the past it it it, it pushes that responsibility elsewhere and um diminishes the spiritualities and the ways of being on the on the land that native people have had um, mm. different sense of being on the land together a greater sense to community, not individual, a greater sense to taking care of community rather than accumulating wealth. I, I think, you know, the land you, you talk about is just sort of what that society was. I think we learned so much that when these Europeans come over, they're, they're dealing with uh, native peoples who are not sophisticated and, and that there are not communities and, and cities, but then you know, I read your book and other things I've studied, you find out obviously there were roads and systems. I thought there was a part of your book that was so fascinating to me about these tactics. Some of the uh, native populations of the Great Plains, I believe, had, had um, created with fire and uh, clearing the land. And then these flowers would sprout and then the elk and the deer would come to eat and then they would get their food that way. I mean, these genius ideas that were stolen from them as well. But how, how important is it to understand and acknowledge that when Columbus shows up, that this is a, a community, tribes that are sophisticated in what they're doing, they create roads and systems that actually allowed Europeans to sort of take some of these methods and survive. Well, some of these methods are coming into greater use and respect, especially in California. Um, where we, you know, we've seen record-breaking fires in California, and um, there's a greater understanding of indigenous knowledge in those areas and uh, stewardship of the land, including the, this fire, use, the use of fire to keep the growth down, so that we don't have these out-of-control fires. Um, so I think, I think when you ask how is import, how important is it to understand that we were not primitive, half-naked savages running around, we were people with intellect with strategies that can be applied today. And it's good, they're being applied today in California. This recognition is a long time coming. I wonder what the role of media played. Um, there's a portion of your book that talks about journalists of the time and the era and how they wrote in favor of the federal government. Um, I think the book, The Last of the Mohicans is one that comes to mind. I think that movie, I remember as a kid, I think it grows something like $183 million. Um, what role did that play in, in just the portrayal of indigenous populations, the way that uh, things were written about and described at that time? I'm glad you brought that one up. I'm glad you brought up that part because 
because kids are still reading those books in their classrooms today. They're still being assigned Last of the Mohicans, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. They're being, dis they're being assigned books written a long time ago by people who didn't know the people they were writing about, um, that used the people they were writing about as a device to make them look good and successful in some way. And so thinking about the role of story of um, the books that kids are asked to read in school then and now, it's, dis it's, it's disappointing that we're still kind of in that same space. That we're still assigning those books. We're still assigning Whitman. Um, uh, we are also um, witnessing uh, polarized media and that some people watch one channel and some people watch another and there isn't much in interaction such that people would learn a more complete truth about what was happening or what is happening. Um, so I think if we, I think, I think an awareness of that, and that's what we tried to build into the book was, let's look at this, think about this. Why is this here? Why did they do that? Trying to help teachers help kids ask critical questions of things that are put in front of them. Um, Cause we as adults need to have that. And we need, it needs to come through the teachers, through the school system. We have to learn that somewhere has to be in school. Speaking of schools, uh, there's clearly an effort around the country to strip the curriculums of our children um, of indigenous history. Uh, it's happening just west of here in South Dakota. Uh, it's happening in other parts uh, of the country where, where the idea is to, in some ways, minimize the, the history, in some ways, completely erase um indigenous history how do we respond to that i thought so much about that like what is the what is the response to this effort from individuals who are who have decided that they don't want any children to learn uh about the true foundations of the country that they live in? i think we have to not be silent I, a big piece of what is necessary because what we're talking about is censorship and banning of books across the country, um, and particularly in Texas and Florida, um, in Pennsylvania. Some of it's happening there too, but it's it's pretty much across the country. Pen America is a literacy organization that's keeping track of that. It's happening pretty much everywhere because there are organized efforts funded by political entities to try and um, get these books out of the classroom. I think. I, I think that's happening because the last 30 years, so many of us have worked so hard to change what gets published, to um, help people see what's wrong with To Kill a Mockingbird, what's wrong with um, um, Walt Whitman, what's wrong with Island of the Blue Dolphins, these things that, that get um, status as classics and are in schools across the country. Helping them see what's wrong with that and having teachers think, that's right. And I'm here to be a teacher. I'm not here to indoctrinate. I'm not doing right by my students when I use these books. And so they reach for different texts. They reach for different books. Um, it's making enough of a difference that publishers are publishing more than ever before that are written by Native and African-American and Latinx and Asian-American writers. We're seeing change. And that change is being met with resistance um, from the people who don't want that narrative out there, who don't want those voices. And so they're, they're being quite successful at getting their legislators to pass those laws. So we really have to be very active in terms of national politics and state politics and get out there and vote, um, support people who are running for office that um, are interested in, in the, the, the truth of history and having that truth be given to kids. I mean, that truth is, is, is so important. I, um, I went to Minnesota State Mankato and I, I wrote a column uh, that said we should get rid of Columbus Day um, because of the terrible person he was. And I got a lot of crazy hate mail from, from people. Um, and that happens when I write about anything involving race, that's just the country we live in. But I do get this sense that it's different with uh, indigenous peoples and that even as an African American, there's this sense that I came from somewhere, and uh, other immigrant populations that have come here. The idea is that they arrived, regardless of what their path and history was, 
they at some point came to this country, this idea that America was here and then we showed up. But it doesn't feel like this country has decided to tell the true story of the first people here who we, everyone else showed up when this country had already been established as, as occupied by indigenous populations. And I wonder how that affects, in your opinion, the narrative. Like to me, I think people are trying to get rid of this history because it's harder to tell the story of America as this prominent place when you understand that these people weren't the first and that they occupied a place that had already been discovered. Yeah, that the, those the chapters in the book about the origin myths and yeah. the ways that that Americans like to think of themselves and this land is exceptional relative to other um, countries. Um, it's a very powerful one, and 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 you see it. You know, you said you get uh, comments to your Columbus material. I I have gotten similar comments for all of the work that I have done, and before before um, COVID. I was wearing out um, from going and giving talks because the last two talks that I, I went to, I had to have some security. I had to have armed wow. security people meet me at my car and escort me to the space where I was going to be speaking. And, and the, the, the cause of that was my, my, the work that I've done on Little House on the Prairie, which is very much the history of this exceptional land. People like that book because they think it's about the brave pioneers and brave Laura. Um, and uh, so I speak out on that particular book a lot, and that's why I get the most threats is for the work that I've done on that. Um, I, I would like, it's an interesting issue. It's an interesting situation for us because white folks like to have mascots across campus because they, across the country, they honor us, they say, with those mascots, but those mascots, are romantic white man's fictions. They're nothing based in reality. Um, so that there's this duality that's going on where you know they, they want to honor us, but they don't want to hear from us. So when we say that's not okay, they're like, you don't get it. And they want to push us aside and set us aside. Um, that the power of that is is why, you know, I think I think it's so important that teachers use this book, that parents use this book too, because there are going to be plenty of opportunities for for parents to um, help their children understand something that's being that comes home from school about Columbus, um, for example, because they're as much as I wish that no one was singing that dreadful Columbus song, it is sung all the time. And it is the way that Columbus is presented in schools across the country is um, it's the way that native people are presented in classrooms across the country. It's in the past. It is Columbus Day and it's Thanksgiving. Um, and the, the opportunities to, to, to say, well, actually, what do Native people think about Columbus? That's, what, that's the conversation to have. And what do we think about Thanksgiving? That also is a conversation to have because it moves the conversation from, oh, those poor, brave Indians to a very powerful presence in the present. I think that's so valuable. I mean, everything you said, you know, I think about the mascots. Um, uh, I work in the sports world and that's always such an interesting conversation how people will try to identify portions of indigenous populations that may be okay or they say are okay with some of these mascots and they'll point to that as sort of justification. Um, and it's great to see some of these mascots being eliminated. But I do think that speaks to how people view a community. I, I know for a fact, Debbie, as an African-American, that if today someone created a mascot that was directly offensive to African-Americans, it would be gone tomorrow. You know, I, I, I believe that people will respond accordingly. But it's hard to wrap my head around this idea that people will see some of these mascots they will hear people like you and others say, this is wrong, and yet they still don't feel as if they have to respond to that. How difficult is that to, oh, to see that? It's tough. It's tough. I, you know, I, my, my uh, PhD is from the University of Illinois. So I, I have been living in Champaign-Urbana 
through um, some, of, some of the most difficult times with the mascot, uh, organizing events um, as a student. And then uh, when, when the mascot was going to finally go down and it wasn't, it, you know, the, the, here's the facts too about when those things come to an end. It isn't because someone has made a moral decision. It's because money comes into play. And so, it, yeah. And so with, 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 uh, with Chief Lanaywick here at Illinois, um, there were threats to what kinds of tournaments could happen on campus if, if the mascot stayed. So they finally got rid of it. And um, the story, you know, I, I, we could talk a long time about mascotting yeah. and that, that because there's, there's so many stories about how that, that we have lived through. Like, so they were going to, the, how that regalia that that mascot wore came to be here. And, and it, it belonged to a native person. And, and then the university thought, well, we need to return it to people, the, the family that it came from. But then the state saying, no, nope, no, nope, they gave it to us. It's now state property and you can't give away wow. state property. So the, the politics of, of everything that happens around every little thing is, is uh, fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's all about power and money. And very rarely is it about just the humanity of who we are and the humanity and moral guidance in the people who are making these decisions about us. Mm. Um, I mean, it happens so often in sports where I've seen so many cases, everything you're describing. I was actually at a game at the University of Illinois when the mascot had been banned, I believe, shortly before this. And the mascot still decided to come to the game and showed up and there was this eruption from people celebrating this. And I just thought how, how disgusting that was to, to see that display, um, to ignore an entire community. I, I wonder sometimes about how um, American historical figures are, are portrayed and how that affects the narrative. You know, obviously Christopher Columbus and how kids especially are taught who he was. Um, and you read your book and you, see what he did with the Arawak people and enslaved them. And um, you think about presidents, George Washington, in, in your book, what he did to the, the, the aligned ally, tribes in the Ohio Valley, I believe, and in, in essentially uh, arming militias to attack these individuals. Thomas Jefferson driving native populations of the Southeast into debt with some of his tactics. But Abraham Lincoln is the most fascinating one to me because I just watched uh, Lincoln, the, the movie, um, and we talked about this Friday. When there's this scene at the beginning of the movie where uh, soldiers, including a black soldier, they recite his four score and seven years ago uh, speech. And it's a very like heroic moment. And I think Abraham Lincoln certainly is one of those presidential figures who is portrayed in this heroic way. But then I read your book, and others like it, and you see that his policies were destructive, detrimental for indigenous population. Who was he and, and what harm did the policies of Abraham Lincoln um, create that affected indigenous communities across the country? He does not, he should not be, um, there's my husband bringing me some water. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> Good. honey. <laughs> Um, Abraham Lincoln is put on a pedestal. And when, when Jean and I are working with um, classrooms of students, that is the hardest part of the book for them because they have been taught over and over about the goodness of Abraham Lincoln. And when they get to the section of the book where we talk about, um, let's see, it was, it was 1862, I think, mm -hmm. that, um, it was 1859 when the Dakota um, land was, their land was taken from them and the state of Minnesota was created and they were confined to a land base and provisions were not provided that were agreed upon part of these treaty um, negotiations. And so they were starving. And so then there's an uprising. They're trying to feed their families. And I think that's a piece that people really don't understand is there's this image in their heads that native people are just men with bows and arrows and spears riding horses. And they fail to understand that these are men protecting their 
families. They have moms. They have dads, they have grandparents and, and children and gardens. And they're trying to, that what's going on is they're trying to protect and, and take care of their families. So there in 1862, when, when um, this uprising took place and it was crushed by the United States Army and um, 303 Dakota people were sentenced to death. It was like a, a sham of a um, trial. And Abraham Lincoln, and this is, we, we don't have all of this in the book because space and things like that but part of part of what we discovered as we were researching that part about Abraham Lincoln is that he thought um he couldn't really execute 303 Dakota men so he decided he needed to review the records and before he started the review of records he thought okay I have to have a reason and I'm paraphrasing the record I have to have a reason to say this person but not this person and his and he decided that the ones that would be executed or hung would be the ones who had raped women. He thought that that'll do it um, because there was such a clamor from Minnesotans that these people be executed. And he, he didn't think it was fair to his credit. He didn't think that was fair, but, he, but the way he went at that task was, okay, we'll just hang the rapists. And then he started going through the files and only two people had been accused of rape. That he decided was not enough. He had entered this review of these files with the idea that these native people were rapists. And if we think about, you know, a recent election in this country when a person felt that Mexicans that were coming across the border were rapists. We see these interesting um, things that don't make sense to us. And until we think about what's going on, what's the power dynamic here? What's the fear being generated? What is What are these people, these presidents responding to and what are they trying to accomplish? So he reviewed the files and he had to come up with a different criteria and he ended up with, with those, um, the Dakota, <coughs> excuse me, Dakota 38. And they were hung on December 26th. Um, and there were 4,000 people there to watch. Mm. And uh, that's, that's the hard part for, in, in particular, when we were working with a group that had a significant number of African-American students in it, they just, they didn't know what to do with that because for them, he has been put on an incredible pedestal. He, he, and, and that was hard for them. And they, and they, that should not have been the case because yeah. if we had not put Lincoln on that pedestal from their earliest elementary school years, then they wouldn't have that sudden sense of betrayal when they are juniors in high school. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's um, especially here in Minnesota. Um, like I said, I went to Minnesota State Mankato and there were so many, you know, kids who grew up in the area who had not heard these stories. And I, and I believe it was, you know, 38 or executed largest mass ex execution in the history of this country. And I believe 300 more members of the Dakota were sent to Fort Snelling where many of them died and, uh, of starvation. And I, I fly um, work, I fly every week. That's so I pass Fort Snelling. And, and the perception of what that is, is this sort of historical marker, especially in the Twin Cities, um, when the reality was that it was a place where people from a community that had been you know, abused and betrayed were sent to die. Um, and I think that's a big part of like Minnesota and what it is and sort of what's happened with Minnesota after the murder of George Floyd. This is relatively a place, Debbie, that doesn't think it has a history rooted in colonialism and racism and white supremacy and all these things. It believes that's everyone else's problems, uh, which is why no one, people don't talk enough about what happened in Mankato. Um, or understand the reality of what Fort Snelling is. How important is that for, for people who live here to really do the work to understand the history attached to what has happened in this state? Well, it's a reckoning. And I think, I think these pieces that you're bringing up of George Floyd um, and the, the Fort Snelling, these are pieces of the same fabric and mm. being able to, to have that reckoning with that fact that Minnesota nice is not actually Minnesota nice. 
that yeah. Minnesota is like any other um, state in the country that has a history that it's not really contending with. There's um there's an uh, I'm, I'm looking I'm going to join the conversation when there's a panel discussion mm -hmm. later. Um, I see that you have Marlena Miles who is going to be on that panel, and yeah. today she was sharing an etching of that execution, um, and that. The thing that was interesting about what she shared is it was that etching of the execution was part of an advertisement for selling in mattresses. And wow. so there's a story there. How, how did that, how does, how does that horrific moment become part of a sales campaign for betting? Um, that's, 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 I don't have the words for that other than not seeing native people as human as human beings and um the same sort of things that we see when we're talking about um george floyd yeah not seeing us as people yeah that lack of humanity i think it's the that's the the fight to be acknowledged uh as human beings and treated accordingly which historically hasn't happened for both uh, of our communities um there's another interesting portion of the book that talks about activism in the 1960s and 70s especially where i mean for the most part when you hear about active activism in the 60s it's the civil rights movement uh it's martin luther king and malcolm x the black panthers um but even some of the you know latino groups and um, some of the uh other groups across the country but you don't hear as much about native american activism so i thought it was really interesting to read about the efforts that that had been made um i think even dating back to the 40s if i'm not mistaken um what role has that activism did that activism play in the community today because we're obviously seeing a lot of young people from indigenous communities who are expressing themselves and, and being very active uh on a variety of issues today well i think there's like two I don't know, saying two tracks is probably not doing justice to the history, but um, when I saw a documentary called Alcatraz is not an island, I was probably 33 or so. And it was I saw it here at the University of Illinois because the filmmaker came to our campus to our program and, and gave some talks and showed the video. And I was really moved by that video because it was clearly a moment in in um, california on alcatraz island when native people were coming together and asserting their presence and what they and they were very smartly using united states law to claim that island because it was according to a treaty um that that, that anything that was abandoned any government land that was abandoned could revert back to native people so they were using that law to take over that island and it was a very powerful video and I saw how it uh, inspired people around me and and of course watching the video how it inspired people to go go to DC and do the Trail of Broken Treaties and to go to Mount Rushmore and pour blood on Mount Rushmore's the president's head on on Mount Rushmore. Um, it inspired lots of actions across the country and I, I was excited about that and then I went home um from illinois and i was meeting with the tribal governor having lunch at his house and and i was telling him yeah i just watched this video and it was it was about uh, activism and how um that's how blue lake got turned back over to taos was that activism and, and he was very very quiet listening to me talk in my excitement and he said that's one thing but there were other things going on too we've been mm. it, we've been working in congress for decades before that happened. So the activism at Alcatraz didn't result in Blue Lake getting turned over to the Taos people. There was two tracks of activism. So th that's been interesting for me to contend with or come to terms with. I don't like that native um, activism is left out of civil rights teachings. It, it needs to be there because it was very big. It was on the news, it was on the national news. We had President um, representatives going out to Alcatraz trying to say, what do you guys want? You can't be here. This is not okay. Um, those conversations were on the nightly news. Um, so that needs to be part of, of, of what gets taught during any instruction on the civil rights movement. Um, and the folks that were there um, at Alcatraz 
They came from nations across the country. And in those nations across the country, their ancestors were there because they had been fighting, because they had been resisting. So it was a different form of activism in terms of like sit-ins and occupations. It was different, but it was there. And so what we did with chapter 10 was try to focus on the on what happened between during the civil rights movement, but also keeping in mind all of the pages up to that were about resistance. Every yeah. chapter was about resistance. And I think that was such an important thing, Debbie, this, this idea that the fight has always been there. You know, I like to tell people when, it, when they talk about African-American history that there were slaves revolting on those ships coming across the ocean. You know, this idea that anyone accepted anything is just completely false. Um, to sort of preach that resilience that continues to this day. Um, I read your book and I think a lot about identity. And, you know, I can admit gr growing up, that I knew a lot of people uh, in my community who would talk about having some level of Native American heritage without knowing exactly what that meant. But you would hear stories about a distant relative or great, great, great grandmother or something like that. And then I think about today with all these DNA sites where people are deciding that they are part Native American and they've decided to align themselves with these ideas. Um, but in your book, you talk about how these DNA sites aren't recognized by a lot of tribes. And a lot of them are scams and a lot of people are trying to use this to claim a certain heritage, but that is completely separate from the reality of a tribal membership and identity. How do you see that? I mean, this idea that people have decided that they are a part of a community without consulting the community itself about what that means. Well, it, um, that's a tough one to talk about because it's, it's, it's very contentious. Um, people with all their hearts believe that they have a native ancestor and some of them do, you know, that's not just a fiction. Some people do. And trying to figure that out is hard work. And the tendency to, to try and use a DNA test to prove that is just a waste of money because the DNA testing does, can't tell you that you have, that you, Myron, have um, the same markers that I do. The DNA science is just not there. It's just not there. And so that's, what, that's going down the wrong road. The right approach is to try to figure out what nation are we talking about and and then um, beginning to have relationships conversations with people of that nation and learning 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 listening 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 because what i what i think we see all too often is that somebody thinks okay i figured it out it's cherokee or i figured out it's lakota or they they come up with a name of a nation and then they start to act in the world like if they are that, and they have not been a part of that. And in and some of the ways that they enact that identity that they are claiming works against the best interests of the nation that they're claiming. Um, the, across the nation, we have had so many instances when our religious and spiritual ways have been categorized in ways that the federal government or the churches would say, if you do that, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be put in jail. Things are there's a, there's a consequence for you if you worship in the way that your ancestors did. Um, so that became part of law and part of what was happening to us in the country. And so so now we we keep that stuff kind of private. You know, when we're engaging in ceremony, we're very careful about it, and we don't talk about it very much because it was mis. We had there's a history of misrepresentation. So people who are kind of like putting the ceremony stuff out there that's that is actually not in the best interest of anybody. Mm. They're, they're doing a lot of um, damage to the nation that they wanna be a part of and um, damage to the people who are reading what they say or write or produce. Uh, it's a very complicated, very complicated situation and um, hard to talk about. But that's, for, for me, one of the key pieces is that people who believe that have to do the work to make sure of that. And then they have to understand what they're asking for, what they're mm. trying to be part of. Because if they run with a romantic idea, then they're doing harm. And, and that's not good for anybody. 
I believe your book talks about 300 nations, if I'm not mistaken, 500, 500 I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder about that reality because I think too often people will talk about indigenous population and native people as a monolith. Right. When there's diversity within the community, why is it so important to recognize that as we try to tell the story and, and understand the, the history? Well, it, because the histories are so different. The history that I and uh, people of Nambe Pueblo experienced is different than the history that Lakotas experienced. Um, our history as Pueblo people goes back to Spanish invasions of our homelands. And um, our languages are different. Our stories are different. Um, the things that we choose to share, the ways that we worship, those are all different and unique and they get collapsed. They get collapsed in the United States into that monolithic idea that you're talking about. Things that, what gets erased in all of that is the idea that we were here first, we have jurisdiction over our lands, we have um, unique ways of being in the world. And, in the, in, in the, and um, when we think about multiculturalism, for example, and how that's taught in schools, it's like, this is a culture, this is a culture. So, Native people are a culture, African Americans are a culture, Latinos are a culture, Asian Americans are a culture. They're all cultures. And when it's when that happens, when we get lumped into that, gone is the idea that we are nations, that, that we were nations before the mm. United States was a nation. Gone is all that uniqueness. And the United States in, in some ways values things like language. And um, the United States really thinks learning how to speak French is a good thing. But Native languages, not so much. Spanish, not so much. So we see these differentials in, in, in all of that. And in fact, we should all be speaking um, as many languages as we can, especially because you're all on Native lands. I, I think too about, um, I think about reparations. I, I, there was a proposal by uh, a professor I want to say 30 plus years ago, where the idea of reparations for African Americans was going after insurance companies that had insured, uh, you know, these cargo ships filled with slaves, going after these state governments um, that had gained revenue, tax revenue from these slave owners and the slave trade in general. It was very specific about what reparations would look like. Um, I think a lot of times we talk about reparations and it's sort of this broad idea. And I wonder for you, when I think about the land that has been taken, we talked about this Friday, but what, what would true reparations look like for the indigenous peoples? What, how would that happen? Well, I think that you, you'll find many people have different answers for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, but for, for, for my point of view and what I have been seeing in the, the land back movement it's actually a movement is is an effort to try to have certain lands returned to native people that means the public lands that are still held by the united states government that's a lot of land and that could be returned to native people who who once called those their homelands that could certainly happen um uh the the black hills you know the mm. the lakota people in black hills and I, I think there's there's certainly lands that that should be returned and that is within reach, that, that is a possibility. It's also, also I wanna to say too, that, that, the, that the perception that we are all removed from our homelands, that's not quite true either because mm. some of us are still on our homelands. Um, the Pueblo people, we are on the lands that we have been on forever. I can go um, to shrines and sacred spaces on our lands there that our Pueblo is not open to the public for any of that, mm. but that land is still there. We're still on that land. So I can walk on the, ground on the land that my ancestors walked on. I can find things there that they left. So we, again, that's the difference in histories. Some people were removed. The Cherokees were removed from their homelands into Indian territory in, in what became Oklahoma. The Pueblo peoples were not removed. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that experience. And we should know that because why did that happen there and not over here? What was going yeah. on? What was the history driving that? difference in, in the experience of those two nations. A couple more questions. I think we have a lot of uh, questions for you, but a couple more for, from me that I've, I've thought about. 
a lot of people ask me this question, uh, especially after what happened to, to George Floyd, this idea of being an ally and kind of what that means. Because I do think there are people who are not a part of communities who want to know how they can best support a community. Um, and I've thought about that as I've read this book and I started this book club. You know, I understand how to tell the story of my community from my perspective. I don't represent all Black people, obviously. Uh, but I've thought a lot about, okay, then how do I reciprocate and also become an ally to other marginalized communities who are also trying to tell their stories, the stories of their communities. From your perspective, Debbie, what does an ally do? What, what is an ally? Um, and, and how can you be that to uh, indigenous peoples? I'd like people to um, take action. I'd like mm -hmm. them to, um, when, when they come, when their child comes home from school with a Columbus coloring sheet, I want them to go to that teacher be active to use their voice, their power, their platform, whatever they have to make some change happen. Um, because what it, I think what happens a lot is, is that um, we do that, but then we move on to another classroom the next year and the, the things revert back to how they were before. That long-term change can only happen when there's a critical mass of people saying, no, we can't keep doing this. And I think what we, what we have seen across the country with Indigenous Peoples Day, a lot of people, a lot of cities have taken away um, Columbus Day and replaced it with Indigenous Peoples Day. That wasn't just because of us, because um, we need allies to, to speak with us and stand with us to make that kind of change happen. So it's, it's showing up, it's being active, and it's also not excusing um, bad behaviors. I, 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 you know, I think, I think uh, like mascots, well, that, that they, but we like you. No, 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 you're not hearing me. This is not okay. Don't defend something that we are saying is not okay. That's, that's mm -hmm. some of the hardest stuff to encounter. And, and in children's books, it's, it's white writers who want to tell our stories. And we're like, back off, let us tell our stories, give us the space to tell our stories and lift our writers, promote our writers and their books. Um, we don't need you. We don't need another story from a white person <laughs> about mm. Native people. We need books by Native people in, in elementary schools and in middle schools and in high schools. Well, I, I really uh, love this conversation. Debbie, I, I have one final question before we go to the, the Q&A. Um, this book has just been an incredible read, but I'm curious for you, when, when people read this book, what do you want them to get out of it? I mean, what do you want them to really take away from this book that they can carry forward? That we're still here, that we have fought like heck and that we are still here. And that anytime they speak of us, they should speak of us in the present tense. They should be saying is and are instead of were. To really, to really use their words <laughs> um, in ways that, uh, change the narrative. That's very powerful. Like that idea is very, very powerful to, to talk about things in the present um, because so many things are talked about in the past. Um, I'm definitely grateful for this conversation, Debbie. Looks like there are a lot of people who have questions. So I'm gonna turn this over to PJ to go to some of the questions uh, that our viewers have had for Debbie. Okay. Great, thanks, Myron. Uh, like you said, we got a lot of questions here, a lot of good questions from the viewers. Um, so I'm just gonna start, start right up at the top here. Um, so how many school districts use this book as an elective or required reading? Um, at I what wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that information. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, kn I, I know that districts are using it. I just don't, there's no way to know that, to have that information. Um, good question. For me too, the what what pushback has been encountered with your book, and then how do you how do you handle that? Um, I haven't had pushback come directly to me about this book. I have seen some things um, in various places where, um, like on Amazon reviews, where people do, don't like the book because they feel that it uh, demonizes white people. And um, so I have seen some of that, but I haven't had any come directly to me. I do know that the book is, is, is being boxed up in some districts in Texas, 
which is very upsetting because um, the kinds of things that we hear from Native parents and Native kids are like, oh, they're so happy because they're, they're finding truth about their nations and the history. And they've never had that experience before. And so um, when these books are getting boxed up, when our book is getting boxed up and taken away, that is denying Native children this fleeting moment that they had of finding themselves and their history accurately presented in a book that was in their classroom. Um, so I'm, that's very disappointing that that's happening. Another question we had um, was that uh, imagining that the book empowers Native teens, um, but it could also create a lot of anger at the way that people have been treated. How do you and other educators help young people channel their energies into positive modes rather than to despair or anger? I hear that question a lot. And I would like it, I actually want some support for the question because it, it feels in some ways that it's an adult asking a question, what if, they're asking like a what if question. That is not what we've heard. Uh, as I noted a few minutes ago, we hear good things from kids who are reading it. We hear uh, Native kids glad for it and non-Native kids glad to have that information. One, one thing that's really important about the impact on, on accurate history for non-Native kids is that the, 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 our book is not just for Native kids, it's for them too, because they're going to grow up and they're going to be lawmakers, they're going to be writing, uh, writing books, editing books, or do, doing something that's in some way going to touch the life of Native people. So if they grow up knowing a better history than, than they would have had otherwise, then that's a plus for everybody. So it's the benefits to all readers are, are good. And I'm not, and I, and I do want to hear some, or I, I do want this, I want support for this idea that kids are feeling despair. I want to see that. Because it feels a lot like um, a little bit disingenuous, I guess. That's a big word to say. But, it, but I, I want some evidence of that. I want to see that that's really happening. I want it to move from the what if space to actually this is what's happening. Great. Um, we've got another question here. Um, one of the viewers was wondering, um, said, is Debbie advocating that the classic books by Whitman, et cetera, be banned, or that if they're included in classrooms or libraries, other books from other perspectives, including indigenous, be included? I want to think about that in, in this way. Um, the library is one space. The classroom is another. A, in a classroom, the responsibility of a teacher is to educate. Um, no teacher is going to miseducate, or they don't want to miseducate. Teachers want to do right by the students that come into their classrooms. Um, when they learn that a book that they're using has misrepresentations in it, I, my experience is they want to set it aside. That's not a censorship issue. That's the res professional responsibility and training that teachers have to do right, to educate, the students that come into their classroom. So it's a different issue. It's not about censorship. It's not about banning. Uh, I think if we if we think maybe maybe we can think back to um, your people can think back to their own childhoods, and maybe I don't know how old people in the audience are, but but there was a time in this country when the ways that women were depicted was awful, and those books are not so much in the classrooms anymore. Um, certainly they are in some. But people are saying, you know, that that's not the way life is anymore. And so they set those books aside and reach for books that are have have more accurate information about women. Um, so I guess I'm I'm also thinking about Little Black Sambo. You know, that book had so much sway and so much power in the early 1900s, and people people understood that that's stereotypical, that it's not actually a good story. Um, because of the uh, racism in it. And so they set it aside and make different choices. What happens in a classroom is different from what happens in a library. So I think that's an important point that people need to know. Great. Um, another viewer says, I'm so glad that you included a chapter on corn. I'm grateful for the indigenous peoples who worked for centuries to create this valuable food. 
Um, it's now commodified and modified to fit the needs of industry and industrial food eaters. Uh, do you have any, what, how do you think that we can go about reestablishing an appropriate relationship with corn? If you have any thoughts about that. Huh, that's, I think this goes back to, to what Myron was asking about being a good ally. What, what are the things that we are doing that we can stop doing that would help restore um, whatever it is that we're, that we're trying to address? Um, so I'm not sure, you know, when we're thinking about corn and, and, and this particular question seems to be about corporate greed and corporate abuse of um, corn and um, other products, probably not products, but other grains and, and the manipulation of those things. Maybe, maybe doing, taking actions to um, help people understand what's happening with that um, is a good step. Um, learning and learning as much as you can and telling others about it. Does that make sense, PJ? I'm I trying. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I had a couple of questions uh, in regards to, to land acknowledgements. Um, so here's, here's one here. It says, the land acknowledgement movement seems to help deepen awareness and honor the history of a place and the people who dwelled there, and in many cases were wrongly removed and deprived of access. But from this perspective, where does everyone belong? Immigrants, refugees, who belongs where? This sets up confusion for me. Who does the land belong to? Who should get access? Uh, the concept is confusing. Huh. Oh boy, that, that's, that's not a question I've heard before. Um, I, I don't have an answer off the top of my head what to do about that. Um, when, when you raised that, that there was going to be a land acknowledgement question, I, I, I um, and concerns about land acknowledgements, there are many. And um, part, part, the ones that I am aware of are that uh, they've become rote, that they get recited and at some conferences, they recite them at every panel opening and they become uh, the sort of thing you just tune out, they lose their meaning and they lose their power. So I think there are those kinds of concerns with that, with a land acknowledgement. Now, this one that's being raised here is, is, seems to be saying that if we acknowledge the existence of native homelands that were hurting immigrants, and um, I just don't, don't understand that really, um, because the people who are coming here I don't know, it'd be hard, you know, I, I would need data to, to make any kinds of observations, but it seems that people come here and they, and many people who come here to the United States do okay. And that if we were to look at um, socioeconomic status data um, on household incomes, um, I think that they, uh, a, an immigrant family who has become part of the upper class perhaps, might feel off put by a land acknowledgement. Um, but to me, that's, that doesn't make sense. I, I, don't know, I don't know how to process that because they have done well and they have land, they do have land. Um, they have a home, they do have resources. And, and I really don't understand how to answer. I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Thanks, thanks for trying. What do you think if you, if you do you know? Do you have a thought? I mean, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of times land acknowledgements can become very rote things that, that do tune out. But I, at the same time, I think it's important because I think a lot of people, you know, even reading the land acknowledgements, which I have feelings about, but I'm sure there are many people who have never had to think about that before. I've never spoken it out loud. So I think I think it can do can do good. You know, I'd like to, to, I, I would like to people say people say, okay, so so if I gave a land acknowledgement here from where I'm sitting today and I'd say I'm on the homelands of 14 tribal nations who used to be in this part of Illinois, one of them is Peoria. And I would say to the audience that I was speaking to, is there a children's book written by a Peoria writer? I want you to go and find out. And if there's not, then I want you to write to some publishers. I want you to make some noise about. Where are the books written by Peoria people? Um, because my heart is always on the storytelling and the books that get into a school uh, classroom. And um, there are not books for every single uh, one of the sovereign 
federally recognized nations. There's not. So the land acknowledgement is a good marker. It does call attention to that, but we have to move beyond that. If we're going to do them, we need to say, where's the books by these people? And are they being used in this classroom today? And if they're not, what can I do about that? Myron? I was gonna add my two cents just to say that that I've dealt with some of this too. And just to, I, I think this place, Minnesota especially, is a, it's a very passive aggressive place. And like I said earlier in our conversation, I think it's difficult for people to understand and accept the real history of this place. And I think it's difficult for people to, you know, understand that Minnesota is not this place that has just been separate from all of the history of this country. But I think a lot of people want to believe that. So I think when they hear some of these things, you now have to think about where you live. You know, the places you pass every day, the true history of where you live. And I think there are a lot of people who would rather not have that experience because life is a lot easier that way when you think everything is as it appears to be. Another question here. Um, many times the native populations are portrayed as ignorant and unsophisticated because they did not have a written language and history was transmitted orally through the telling of stories. Um, oftentimes Europeans think of these as fiction rather than history. However, native names for places and people are usually so descriptive. How important is the teaching of native languages to the survival of the people? And how can non-native people come to understand the depth and complexity of native languages? I think the com that, that I think it's very easy for us in this country, probably in other countries too, to fall into a trap of thinking about, well, this here is literacy. Um, and actually that concept is very white. I mean, it, it, it falls into the, a trap of saying, so-and-so gets to decide what is literacy and you don't have it. <laughs> you primitive Indians, you don't have literacy. And that's not true. We had ways of, when we think about what is it to be literate, we had ways of communicating. That's, that's, it didn't look like a piece of white paper with letters on it, but we had ways of communicating. We had ways of exchanging information. And that's why these networks of trade were across the country. So the idea, so people have to really let go of the idea that primitive and um, oral is less than, because it isn't. It, it's just different and we value one and not the other. So that's a huge um, problem that, that we see over and over. And I also think some of this is very cyclical because um, we all use, the internet, we all use text, we all use those little emojis and, and these um, means of, of, of using an image to convey a whole lot of information. And Native people have been doing that forever too. If you think about the, the petroglyphs in, in some parts of the country and what that meant, what, that's, what was told by that, it's just a different, it's not a less than, it's different. And um, so I'm wondering how, how, how the how we're going to go forward, the, the power of the idea that, that a certain people can determine what counts as literacy, I reject that really with a great deal of um, theory. <laughs> theory that I say in a whisper. Um, another question, I, I really liked this question a lot, but what are some ways to share indigenous joy with our students? I'm going to come right back to children's books because part of what part of what part, part, I feel better right now, Myron, than I did when we first started out because the history is really hard, and so there's not a lot of joy when you're talking about some of that history. But when we talk about us in the present day and what we're doing, what we are working on, that's joy. And so, so I come right back to children's books. I can say, go get Cherie David's book. Um, Sharice David's, you know, she has a picture book up. A lot of people don't know that. And there's so much joy in that book because look what she did. She ran for Congress and she became a Congresswoman. There's many children's picture books and middle grade novels and young adult novels that are full of joy because of, of what, what our people did before and what our people are doing now. Um, so absolutely joy can be had and it should be had. And the idea that, um, I know that this is, ridiculous, but when people think native, they think drum beats, 
they think flutes. I want them to think about way more than that. I want them to think about native voices and the joy. Um, another viewer said, asks, the United States and Minnesota especially is full of buildings, companies, schools, camps, and especially cities and towns with native names or associations. What's your perspective on how we should reckon and engage with these? Are most like the land stolen and akin to mascotting? I think it really depends. I, I'm really excited. I know that, in, that Minnesota renamed a lake, right? PJ, do you know what lake that was? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, De Makaska, um, okay. formerly known as Lake Calhoun. Okay, yeah. So um, it's not what the question is. The question is like the state, um, a state that's, that's name is actually a native word. Um, I think that's what they're talking about. I think that's what the question is about. Um, it's a, talking about like buildings, companies, schools, like cities and towns. Um, maybe not necessarily states, but I'm seeing like buildings, companies, schools. Is, like so is this a question of, of the appropriation and, and, and um, uh, I guess the, representation the, that goes along with some appropriations? Yeah, I think that's kind of what I'm getting from it. Okay. Yeah, I think we need to have honest conversations about that and what what those um, names signify and what Native people would like to see happen with that. I, I'm very excited about so many name changes that are happening across the country for um, some mascots that are going away, but also a lot of buildings that are being renamed and um, um, schools. I think like in, in Minneapolis, there's been several schools that got renamed recently. Like I think one was called Shelby and right, Shelby, Ch Shelby and that one got named after some, a native person perhaps, I don't remember. But these are positive steps that were, that I think that we are um, reckoning with, with um, history and the way that history has played into the naming of places. Um, and regarding um, DNA identity versus cultural tribal identity, um, what do you think about, what do you think of our Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan as an indigenous representative, um, considering she grew up in an urban majority white affluent area? It doesn't matter where you grew up. If you are a citizen of a native nation, you are a citizen of a native nation. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter where you grew up. That's, that's just the bottom line on that. I, there's a new children's book that came out a couple of years ago about Peggy Flanagan. Um, I really like that book because she talks about her childhood. She talks about being in school, in, um, in elementary school, and the teachers writing Columbus on the, on the chalkboard and what that does to her, um, how that feels to her. That's part of this biography about her. Um, she doesn't cease being a Native person because she happens to be growing up in an urban, mostly white area. She, she still is who she is. Um, and I think that that kind of argument is um, not understanding what it means to be a, a person of a native nation. Um, how do we educate educators on the language they use when speaking of indigenous people? Uh, this book was the first time I've heard the language systems, irrigation, people as scientists, etc., used when speaking about indigenous people. Hand them the book. I think, I think it is, it's another one of those instances when you want to be an ally, that means you have to pass on the information that you have. And that could be talking about the book. It could be getting the book for the school that um, a teacher is working in, getting it for the local libraries. And, and it doesn't have to be just that book. It doesn't have to just be our book. There are, there are more books by Native writers now than ever before. So we have many, many good choices. Um, I have so enjoyed reading your book. Um, it helped me see this country and understand its actions and patterns of oppression from another frame of reference. I've been waiting for this book, I believe, all my life. Um, do you have any other suggestions for conversations on Indigenous history? Uh, people should, um, who have the book, people, everybody, should go to the um, Beacon website. Can you, can somebody there um, push that out, PJ? The Beacon website 
who Beacon published the book. And when we were getting near the end of the process, we wanted to have, they, they wanted a curriculum guide for it. And so they hired Natalie Martinez, who is from Laguna Pueblo, one of the Pueblos in New Mexico. And she's a professor of education to write a curricular guide for the entire book. It's free, you can download it at no charge. Um, she also did one for Indigenous Peoples Day and these are all keyed to the chapters in the book. Indigenous Peoples Day and, and Thanksgiving. And then I think there's one about the Mayflower because Mayflower had its 400th year anniversary. So, um, those resources that go with the book are free. And, I, and I, I really encourage teachers to get them, parents to get them, homeschoolers to use them, everybody should use them. Um, another question that just came in, um, this one might be a little directed more towards Myron, um, but it says Myron mentioned in an article he wrote in the Star Tribune a few months back about the addictive aspect of being able to get away with some abuse and that addiction is not being addressed. Uh, i.e. people participating in a lynching knowing that it is wrong but go along with it because they feel powerful because they know they can get away with it. Can you speak to that? Well, well yeah, I mean, I think maybe they're referencing what happened in Duluth uh, where the three black circus workers were lynched uh, after being falsely accused of uh, assaulting a woman there and there was a crowd uh, around them and, you know, even uh, Debbie spoke to, I believe, 4,000 people witnessing the execution in Mankato of the 38 D Dakota um, members. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I guess in general, when I think of racism, especially here, um, I am less concerned about sometimes the more overt um, elements of it, because I think people today are, are more afraid of what they may have to lose um, when things happen so publicly and openly. I mean, you see these situations happen and people post something or they say something at work and they lose their jobs. But I'm far more concerned about these things that I think support those instances. Um, you know, what happens at the kitchen table and the way people talk within their families, what happens in their group chats that no one sees. Um, so, so I do think there is this component of people going along with things and not feeling that they're culpable. But I think history suggests that, in fact, those are actually the most dangerous people uh, because they are supporting those who are doing these overt acts of oppression and, and racism. I mean, Derek Chauvin's knee to me, uh, he did that to George Floyd because he believed he lived in a community that would support the dehumanization of that individual. And that's my perspective on that. I think he thought he had people behind him. And um, it's, a, it's important to not be one of those people who are watching the lynching as it's happening and not saying anything. Um, why does misinformation about indigenous people of the United States persist? What approach can be taken to white people who feel dissed when accurate indigenous history is taught or revealed? When they're dissed, when they're embarrassed, when they are, when they are feeling a sense of shame for what they don't know. Um, I, I, I guess I, I guess I want them to think about native kids and the life of native kids, which is one of being chained every day in the classroom by the history textbooks and by um, the things that people say, you know, sit Indian style, um, circle the wagons, all of these things that, that native people contend with day in and day out. Um, I'd like them to shift away from, oh, from their looking at themselves and to thinking in a larger space about what all of these things are doing to native people. Um, discomfort over being told that something you thought you knew was okay to say or do. Um, it, it, it's, it's embarrassing. I've been there, <laughs> we've all been there because we were all socialized in the same country that, that, that when I was in first grade, I loved the book, Five Chinese Brothers. And, it wasn't until I was an adult and I realized, oh my God, 
You know, I, I have been holding on to this racist book for 30 years. Um, and when, when it was pointed out to me, I was embarrassed. Um, but you, you own and recognize that you were brought up in a country that has a long history of trying to otherize people who are not white, to denigrate, dismiss, stereotype, show us all as less than. And um, um, understanding that history and, and who was served by that history, I think it's important. Well, thanks, Debbie. Um, I think that's all the time we had for audience questions, um, but I'm going to pass it uh, back to Myron. Thank you, PJ, and and thank you so much, uh, Debbie, for this wonderful conversation uh, that we had tonight. I learned so much, um, and I I'm grateful that we were able to uh, have this conversation um, and discuss these these issues. Um, one thing I thought about was uh, Marianne Key again. Uh, I always go back to to her and um, who who she was and what she represents in my my own personal history and and, and my life. And um, you know, I, I named this book club after her because I I wanted those who came before us to know that they were not forgotten. Um, to know that the things they did still matter. And as, as you were talking, I thought about Marianne Key's enslaved when she's 14 years old, um, a part of a community of stolen people who are brought here to tend to stolen land and that shared history there. Um, and just the reality of those who are forgotten when the story of America is told. You know, those who are pushed aside when the story of America is told. Uh, and I'm so grateful to have this book from you and have this conversation because I feel like it demands for those people to be heard. It, it demands for the voice of indigenous peoples to be recognized. And I, I guess I would like to believe that those who came before us in our respective communities uh, would be proud of the reality that you emphasize so poetically in the book that we're still here and the acknowledgement of that presence. Um, so I'm very grateful for this conversation. So thank you again. Do you have your copy with you? Is it right there? It's right here. Okay, look at the index. Look up George Washington in your index. Okay. L. George Washington. I see it. Okay. You will not find another book that has his identity in parentheses after his name. This is wow. a first because Oof. as we are working on the index, we said enough of that. Everybody yeah. came from somewhere. He doesn't get to be just that. George Washington. I love that. That's unique. And it's important. It is. It's important to this story. Um, thank you again for those who are viewing. Uh, please do the survey. And then also May 12th will be our panel event. Great cast of local folks. Uh, please sign up for that as well. And thank you again, Debbie. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for this book. And thank you to all who have joined us to participate in this important conversation. Thanks for having me. Good night.